Welcome to episode 275 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak encouragement into the hearts of educators and get you informed and energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Elena Aguilar about what it means to bring the best version of yourself to the classroom each day. Visit truthforteachers.com to get an easy to read, easy to share version of this podcast episode. I've partnered with Dan Tricarico, a current high school teacher in San Diego and founder of the Zen Teacher Project, to create a special resource to help with the unique challenges of teacher anxiety. It's a resource called Finally Free, and it includes 10 audio modules and a reflection workbook to address the biggest mindset challenges most teachers face. Our vision for this toolkit is to be a resource for isolated, discouraged, or unsupported teachers, so you can listen to practical encouragement and reassurance whenever you're facing overwhelm and anxiety. We help you reframe your thoughts to find freedom from comparison, the pressure to do more, worry over students, overwhelm, urgency, and more. If you've ever wished that you had a positive, supportive mentor who would encourage you on a regular basis and give you strategies for working through your anxiety when it feels overwhelming, this toolkit will allow Dan and I to be your virtual mentors. Get the entire Finally Free Toolkit for the limited time price of $29 at finallyfreetoolkit.com. That's finallyfreetoolkit.com. My guest today is Elena Aguilar. She is a writer, leader, teacher, coach, and the author of seven highly acclaimed books, including The Art of Coaching, Onward, Cultivating Emotional Resilience in Educators, which is a personal favorite of mine, Coaching for Equity, and most recently, the PD book, Seven Habits That Transform Professional Development. Elena is the founder and president of Bright Morning Consulting and the host of the Bright Morning Podcast, which is a phenomenal listen, by the way. She also collaborated with Dr. Rebecca Brandstetter and I on our Reversing Educator Burnout course, so you can hear Elena as a special guest expert in Module 2 of our Burnout course. Elena has taught thousands of folks how to have conversations that build a more just and equitable world. She's one of the most heart-centered educators I know, and I think you'll really enjoy her unique take on the questions I ask. Listen in. So Elena, in your work, you talk a lot about who an educator is, their way of being, and how that has a tremendous impact on the quality of their work and relationships. And this is one of the things that I admire about you the most, because I feel like there's a tremendous emphasis in education on what teachers are doing and very little attention being paid to who they are as people. And to me, we're missing one of the most fundamental aspects of learning if we ignore the actual human beings who are facilitating that learning. So there's just so little concern, in my opinion, paid to teacher morale and well-being, to lightening teachers' workloads and stressors. And the funding seems to go towards things that directly impact student test scores um, scores instead of ensuring that the people who are teaching our children are happy and healed and whole human beings. And that has always been mind boggling to me. So anytime I see your work, it is just a breath of fresh air. Anytime that something you've produced um, or that Bright Mornings has done comes through my social feeds or is brought up in a conversation, um, it's just your work is so, so needed. So I would love to hear what your thoughts are on this and what you mean when you talk about bringing the best version of yourself to the classroom. Thank you. There is so much that you just shared that resonates with me that I could, that I was like, yes, yes, yes. I know. Why are we looking (laughs) at the human beings? But it's also, it's not either or it's not Mm. teachers or test scores or teacher well-being, or it's not binary like that. It's like, there is a connection between all of this and we can do many things and we can look at the human beings and how they are doing and take organizational institutional responsibility for developing well-being. We can do that and we can pay attention to children and their well-being and their achievement and their test scores. We can do it. So 
Let me come back to your question, which is, what does it mean to bring the best version of yourself to the classroom? I love that question, mostly because it opens up a whole conversation. And I would really invite any listeners, anyone to think, what does that mean for you? So for me, I think the best version of ourselves, maybe I'll speak for myself for a moment. The best mm -hmm. version of myself is the version of me that is fully present, that is acutely self-aware and present for every little thing that comes up, for everything that happens. And when I am able to access that state of being, it also allows me to access the part of myself that I love the most, the part that's energized and open and curious and full of zest and passion, the part of me that's willing to take risks, the part of me that's courageous, the part that feels everything. So I can only access all those parts of myself when I am fully present, because otherwise I'm living in the past or in the future. And so I think that at its essence is my best self is one that's fully present that can then tap into all these ways of being. And I really think about, you know, this, like, let's also think beyond the classroom, because what if we could consider bringing our best version of ourselves to the living room and to the grocery store and everywhere? So this, your question is really one to me about what allows us to be fully human, to explore and embrace all the dimensions of our humanity. And again, it's only through that exploration that we get to be our best selves. And those best selves really emerge when we have engaged in deep reflection and growth, when we know ourselves, when we've done the work on ourselves, then our best selves come out when we are fully present. And, you know, if we could bring our best selves to the classroom, our schools would be different places and the experiences for children would be different. And yes, their test scores would be higher if we all had, you know, were able to develop these capacities to be fully present and to tap into all these aspects of ourselves. So let me stop there. You know, what you're saying reminds me of research on flow, that flow mm -hmm. state where you're so absorbed in what you're doing that you just lose all sense of, of time. And I think those are the best moments as a teacher where it's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe there's only five minutes left in this in this lesson because I'm mm -hmm. so engaged with the kids. Like that will make up for so much uh, tedium, monotony, data entry meetings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's research showing that um, 90 minutes a day is the ideal amount of time for a flow state. And it may not be in work. It could be an exercise. It could be in uh, gardening, walking, creating, but like that's really an ideal for humans. And when I think about what that would be like to have 90 minutes of the school day for teachers to be in the state of flow where they're fully present and engaged, and what would that be like for learners if students could spend 90 minutes of their school day? I mean, even just starting with 10 to 15 minutes where you just are totally present with the people around you, with the task, engaged in it, it is just, it's an optimal state of human beings, um, of, of being a human. And I think it's something that, um, I don't know, that's just kind of what came to mind when you were talking about being present. Yeah, I think that's a, um, uh, that's a really interesting connection to make. And you can't be in a flow state unless you are fully immersed in the bright. I mean, it's like you, if you are thinking about the past or worrying about the future or ruminating or creating um, unhelpful stories about what's going on, then you're not present. You're not, you can't be in flow. And so I think that is an interesting connection to make. But I also think that we can experience the really difficult parts of teaching or life from a place of presence and actually taking it all in, or what at least I know I fall into a lot is from a place of sort of pushing back, not wanting it to be this way, feeling, um, creating all these stories and feeling angry and resentful and scared. And that's in some ways, I mean, we can be scared and be fully present or we can be scared and not be fully present. So I think mm. there's a quality here of actually being with whatever comes up, whether that is our own fear or sadness or worry or joy or it deep absorption in a lesson and in an experience with kids. This is um, 
I think the key to being able to respond to whatever happens, to deal with anything that happens. Right. When you're present, then you're not resisting. You're mm-hmm. you're ready to respond to whatever is coming. And and I love what you said about how being our best version of ourselves is not just for something for work, but like you know, you gave the example of the grocery store and I think about that a lot. You know, sometimes I have encounters with people just randomly in places like that and they're totally present. You know, we'll have a little conversation mm-hmm. or Um, you know, you treat people better when you're fully present, when you're rushing to the next thing and you're thinking about what you have to be doing and your mind is in another place, you don't notice other people, you don't engage with them, you don't pay attention to what's going on with them and their needs, nor do you get anything back from those engagements. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times have I checked out of the grocery store and, and been looking at my phone and not paying attention to the person who was, you know, processing my payment and everything at all? Versus mm-hmm. when I stop to be really present there, notice them, make eye contact, thank them sincerely. Like mm-hmm. it is a, such a more meaningful way to go through life when you think about like bringing the best version of myself to every situation, not just to my work. I love that you brought that up. So, uh, probably maybe 12 years ago or something, 15 years ago, I heard someone talking about um, something that ended up resulting in a huge change that I made really at the grocery store or any of those places where, you know, where, you, where someone, someone who is in a position of service to you and they say, hi, how are you today? And you say, fine, thank you. So i had heard this thing and it prompted me to start saying, I'm doing okay. How are you today? Mm. And I, every time, so grocery store, the coffee shop, whatever, um, even on the phone when, you know, a service person, and I can't tell you how many times someone would like look up at me and say, Oh, thank you for asking. Mm. And it was this moment that sometimes was, you know, 15 seconds. Sometimes it ended up being a 30, you know, 60 second connection, but it was a connection and it felt so meaningful. And it was a moment for me of slowing down and not Mm -hmm. going through everything in this rote. And I think you raising that made me think something I've been exploring recently and talking about, writing about is the six core human needs. And so psychologists group our human needs into the six categories. And the first one is the need for connection and belonging. And this is a core human need. Every human being needs connection and belonging. And probably everyone listening is like, yeah, yeah, I know that. And so then the question is, so how do we create that for ourselves every day? And this was one of these, I was just kind of, I have since been amazed by how much I get back from pausing and saying to someone, I'm good, thank you. How are you? How are you today? And just Mm -hmm. that moment. And so this is, you know, in some ways that is a moment where I feel like I am being my best self. It's a moment when I have slowed down enough to actually be with whatever's happening and the person in front of me. Mm -hmm. You know, I I wonder what you would say to someone who's listening to this and thinking, I never really considered any of this. (laughs) Sounds like Angela and Elena have thought a lot about what it means to be the best version of themselves. I'm not sure I've really thought about it. And to them, maybe it feels like an additional pressure, particularly when we talk about bringing the best version of yourself to the classroom, because there's already so much pressure. Teachers need to be experts in such a wide range of really complex skill sets, you know, from, you know, communication to planning, to assessment, to you know, uh, partnering with other stakeholders, like parents, like it is just a really complex job. And there's very little room for error for teachers. You know, they're not really allowed to be human and make mistakes and and to fall short. So I wonder what you would say to someone who's thinking, great. So on top of everything else right now, now I have to be the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. Isn't that just one more expectation on me? And I wonder how we can frame our thinking about that. Because for me, it actually eases the burden. It lightens the load. Thinking about this brings me back to what's essential instead of the mundane or um, you know, from the to-do list. It brings me back to something that feels more meaningful. But I know for some folks, it can feel like it's adding to that weight. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if I was listening, I would probably have been one of those teachers thinking like, yeah, now I have to do more. (laughs) So when I think about teachers bringing their best selves to the classroom, 
one of the things I think about are the conditions that need to be created so that that can happen. And yeah, right now, in some places, you cannot bring your whole self to an organization. You know, for folks with identities that have been historically marginalized, in some places, it's just not safe. Some organizations are so toxic and so harmful that you can't take risks. You can't express your passion. Self-development doesn't exist in a vacuum. You can only bring your best self to a place where there's some receptivity, where there's some space for that best self. So that's one part of this answer. I would say, yes, there's conditions, but there's another component to this answer, So I worked in a school for a while where I really wanted to bring my best self. I was really working on myself. I was taking all these courses. I had a coach. I was really deep in my meditation practice. And I really, really tried. In that school, there was just no space for that self to really be expressed or to grow. And I finally realized it was such a hard realization, but I realized I needed to find a different place to work. And I say it was a harsh realiza- a hard realization because I felt like there was a part of me that felt like I was failing. Like if mm. I could only shift my attitude or if I could only keep working on myself. And I realized like, no, I had done all this work to recognize that I actually needed to kind of set some boundaries. And I had this clarity that I needed to find a different place. And so this message that I'm sharing that I think you're also sharing is about knowing yourself and bringing your best self. And it includes an invitation to consider whether the place you're in or the work conditions you're experiencing allow for the full development of that self. And so This is an invitation to deeper self-knowledge and to exploring the conditions in which you can thrive, to recognizing and acknowledging any pain that might be present, sadness, anger, fear, all those uncomfortable emotions are part of you. You have to know them. You have to integrate them in order to thrive. But giving yourself permission to say, here now, is this a place? And, And to even entertain the idea that Maybe I'm going to just throw this out there. Maybe it's also not teaching. Maybe it's not teaching that grade or that content or in that school or in that district or in that organization. Maybe it's not right now. I also, I think we have this mindset to sometimes that if we were to decide that teaching wasn't the right thing, we'd be failures. We'd be, you know, I, at least that was the experience for me. Every time I thought, maybe I, maybe I can't be a teacher. I felt such shame. And, um, and it was only when I really thought, well, maybe it's not this school or this grade, or maybe there are ways I can contribute, but not in the classroom. And it was actually, I think I, you know, I taught for 12 years when I moved into a coaching role, I did a coaching teaching role for many years And when I moved into that, I actually felt like I found ways to have even greater impact on kids. So there's, so yeah, if you're listening to this and you're thinking like one more thing, yeah, there's something for you to explore there. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I'm really glad that you made that point because I think a lot of times teachers feel like if they're not thriving, the problem is them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can think of many, many schools in which I would have a very difficult time bringing the best version of myself. Like the context does matter. And your point about safety as well matters. Mm -hmm. I've talked before in the podcast about how showing up as the best version of yourself is not really about trying super hard, you know, and, and working to be your best self and working to change your negative habits or traits and going like all in on the self improvement. A lot of times it's more about releasing things. It's about releasing unhealthy coping mechanisms and healing trauma, unpacking biases, unlearning patterns that are no longer serving you. Because I believe that at our core, we are all good inside, as Dr. Becky Becky Kennedy says um, in her awesome, awesome work about um, parenting and, and, and children. We are the people our students need. We are good enough for our students. So the job is not to become better educators or become better people, but to show up each day in our work as healthy and happy and healed as possible. I wonder what your thoughts are on on that interpretation. My thoughts are like, if you could see me and be like, I'm like, yes, 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 yes. (laughs) I'm so with you on all of this. My head is like nodding. So I'm so with you on 
okay, almost all of it, let me say, with the exception, I had to have a response to the word happy. So I don't mm. know if we need to show up as happy because in some ways I think it's almost like impossible because happiness is an emotion, right? In a way, it's a state and it comes and it goes. And I think there's a lot of pressure on people, on teachers, on women to smile and be happy. And sometimes mm. that crosses over into the realm of toxic positivity, which is the suppression and denial of emotions. And so again, coming back to like in my work, I talk so much about mindfulness and presence. And I think we need to learn how to show up and be fully present. Um, makes me think about a Buddhist teacher I've learned a lot from, Sylvia Borstein. One of my favorite things that she says, it's kind of like a mantra that she offers, is meet every moment fully and meet every moment as a friend. And I just love that. And I think about that so often. That's often an intention I set for myself. Meet every moment fully. Be fully present. And then meet every moment as a friend. Approach the moment with openness, openness with a sort of quality of curiosity, of benevolence, of friendliness. And so what does it take to do that? And that's where I'm totally aligned with you that to do that requires releasing unhealthy coping mechanisms. It means healing our trauma, unpacking our biases, unlearning patterns. I, I talk a lot these days, I've been talking a lot about healing because unhealthy mm. coping packer, patterns um, coping mechanisms that that was a response most likely in our childhood or young adulthood even that um, a response to some kind of difficulty or pain or, or event. And so doing that deep inner work and, uh, you know, here it's again, it's like, it's not just for our jobs. It's not just what our students need. It's really our birthright. It's our birthright to mm. heal. It's our birthright right, to live with ease, with openness, with joy, with happiness when it comes and goes, to live fully when when the moments of sadness or frustration happen, to actually really be in those and not be repressing them or, or, or engaging in uh, unhealthy coping mechanisms, but to live and experience the full range of emotions, to live with full presence. This is, we deserve this for us and our students deserve it. And they deserve us to be having that kind of experience. They will benefit if we are having that kind of life. Hmm. And thank you for pushing back on my word of happy too. I hadn't really thought very deeply about that. And I and I should because happiness isn't the goal. It is the byproduct. I'm, I'm wondering if the word I'm looking for is more like having like an inner peace mm -hmm. or contentment, an ability to be present. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think happy, yeah, happiness is tricky. It's also just laden with so much different kinds of meaning that we've uh, imposed on it. I do think about a word that for me resonates um, sometimes is ease. And hmm. for me, ease, sometimes even when I'm experiencing a lot of fear, I can do so in a way that feels easier when I'm not. What happens to me is when I experience fear, I often it becomes a cycle of emotions. I don't like feeling afraid. So then I start feeling ashamed or I feel angry or I feel afraid of the fear. And all of that is not easeful. It's complicated, right? So when I feel fear, but it's from a state of ease, I'm actually able to go, oh, there's fear arising. And then I have a set of strategies that I can use to actually be with it and not push back against it. I do, you know, sometimes I like the word joy Again, it's an emotion. It comes and goes, but it's one that I um, recognize as maybe it just isn't as laden yet with the meaning making that happiness has had forced upon it. Um, but yeah, sometimes I do, I bristle a little bit. But again, it's an emotion. It, emotions just come and go and we get so attached to them, like the ones that we like, or we get so aversive to one, the ones we don't like. Like, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be sad. But again, that's why I come back to like, living with full presence and being with it all, just being with whatever comes up. I mean, you know, somebody you love dies. And if you don't want to be happy at that point, you want to feel the grief. The grief is a reflection of the love. And so, but you got to be fully present to really feel it. Right, right. Yeah, happiness is not the goal at all times. And I love the word ease. I love that. I think about even working through grief 
you know, with ease, I think about the path of water flowing, right? It takes a path of least resistance. And Mm -hmm. sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's slower. Do you think that the best version of ourselves looks different from day to day, or even from hour to hour? Uh, What do you think um, is a helpful framework in terms of thinking about our inconsistencies in moods and productivity and output? Yeah. So, okay, let me come back to this idea that now I'm I'm going to I'm going to keep hammering on a little bit, but I think mm-hmm. the best version of ourselves is a version that is fully present and kind. And and so if that's the best version of ourselves, then we're going to see differences in how we show up day to day, hour to hour. So, for example, if I have to teach on a day when I didn't sleep well because my kid was up throwing up all night. Then I had a frazzled morning getting ready and trying to find backup childcare. I didn't get breakfast and so on. I may not feel like I'm being the best version of this myself, but if the best version of myself is a fully present version of myself, then as I go through all of these inevitable experience, because we're all going to have sleepless nights and kids get sick and so on and so on. There's traffic driving to work. But if I can be fully present, then I can have much more influence on how I respond to things, how I respond to the student who rolls her eyes when I give the class directions, how I can respond to, you know, an email from my principal saying, we've got to have a 15 minute staff meeting after school, right? If I'm fully present, then I can recognize I'm exhausted and I'm frustrated right now. I'm frustrated at this request and and so on. So yeah, I think the best version of ourselves might look different depending on what we're determining that is. But if our the best version of ourself is something along the lines of I'm fully present, I'm really here with whatever happens and I'm taking a general approach or attitude of kindness towards it, then there might be some difference or there might not. Hmm. I like that. I like that a lot, Elena. That's a great answer. Thinking about just being present with whatever's coming up. And sometimes you'll handle it in in ways that you're proud of. Sometimes you won't. Um, But just sort of allowing that to be looking for the path forward with ease. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is so good. My mind is going in a million different directions. (laughs) Tell me about what traits or dispositions we're typically showing when we're bringing the best version of ourselves to school. What else should we look for? You've mentioned now presence and also kindness, which I think is a big one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think the traits or dispositions we show when we're bringing the best version of ourselves to school are curiosity, compassion, courage, openness, wonder appreciation, humility, Mm -hmm. self-awareness, reflection, non-reactivity. Again, like, okay, so there's this quote that I love. No one knows who actually said it or wrote it. The quote is, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. I love this. Mm -hmm. I always think about this between stimulus and response. There is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In that space is our power. In that space is our freedom. And so things will happen. There are always going to be things that happen that we can't control. All we can control are our thoughts and our response to what happens And we can't control our emotions. Emotions arise, but we can control the stories we tell about them, the thoughts. We can control how much we get stuck on them. We can control how we express those emotions. And so when we have acute self-awareness, then we're going to have a much more capacity to be non-reactive, to not respond to the stuff that happens, to the things that might get us emotionally activated. So then when we feel some kind of uncomfortable emotion, we can actually tune into that and respond to that rather than the external stimuli. So when we cultivate presence, we become less reactive. And so I think, again, in addition to curiosity and compassion, humility, and all of those that I mentioned, I think it's really this like 
acute self-awareness, the ability to be reflective, to know ourselves, and then be able to act on that awareness that we have with that capacity. I like I like the word curiosity. That that's one of my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, I, that's one of my favorite things to cultivate in myself too, because it just brings so much more joy and awe and wonder yeah. to life. And I feel like curiosity keeps me from being reactive and judgmental when yeah. I encounter someone who sees something differently than me. Like it, it goes really hand in hand with that humility and, and, and compassion. Is um, you know wondering what is it about this situation and that I don't understand? How could mm-hmm. I learn more? Um, what might this person have experienced? What might this person know that I don't know or that I haven't experienced? And that curiosity can kind of bring you back to that place of ease, bring you back to that place of of kindness. What's your experience with with the importance of curiosity? So I have long talked about the two most important dispositions or orientations for transformational coaches are compassion and curiosity. Hmm. And that really that's in some ways that's all we need. And a few years ago, I was doing some reflection on this and I was doing some reading from many different places. And I had this kind of what felt for me like this epiphany, which was that you can't actually be truly curious unless you have a certain, unless you feel a certain level of safety. And unless you feel a certain level of trust in yourself to be able to deal with anything that happens, unless you feel a certain amount of self-compassion. And so I've actually come to see that there's a relationship between these words and there's something of a sequence. And so you actually need to deeply cultivate compassion, including self-compassion, before you can be truly curious. When you're feeling really afraid, you know, imagine a child living in a place where there's a war going on and hiding in a bombed out building and not knowing whether their family is alive and they're, and then hearing the bombs, like they are not going to be curious about who's throwing these bombs. I wonder why they're throwing these bombs. (laughs) I'm giving you a super extreme example to kind of just like, we actually have to have a certain level of safety to be able to be curious about what's going on for. And so I'm saying this, one of the other things I've been learning a lot about in recent years is about trauma and trauma-informed coaching. And I've been doing a lot of exploration, I'll say, you know, including into myself and my own life and just having so many insights into what it takes for us to truly be curious and how when you are living with tremendous pain and trauma, it's really hard to activate that part. So I'm just saying that because I've said there have been some people I've coached sometimes who are like, I can't really feel curious. And as we dug deeper into it, it's like, oh, there's, these are the blocks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What would you say to someone who's thinking, I know I have so much to offer my students, but I'm just exhausted. I'm stressed. I'm distracted. And I feel guilty because I'm not fully present with my students. I'm getting easily irritated in class and there's just so much pressure on me. I'm not present. I I am not bringing my best kind self. Um, How do I move from the state of being and start showing the best version of me to my students? Yeah. The first thing I'd say is I hear you. I hear the pain you're in. I hear the suffering you're experiencing. I hear you're not being who you want to be. And this is a really hard place to be. And acknowledging it just like you're doing is really important. And so I'd say the first step is to be kind to yourself. You know, if someone that you loved, your best friend, your child, someone you love tremendously said this to you, what would you say to them? Maybe you just want to give them a hug and show your care. For so many of us, self-compassion is really hard. And it is an essential first step towards becoming the person you want to be. You know, it's, it's like that, like you can't pour from an empty cup. 
you can't give to others until you've given to yourself. And so more concretely, I'd say like build up your support system, get yourself a really good therapist. I'm a huge fan of therapy. Tell some close people that you're really struggling. I I think I also want to just like acknowledge if someone said this to me, I want to acknowledge, I want people to know that rates of depression and anxiety are so high in our world right now. And amongst teachers, the rates are even higher. So when someone tells me this kind of thing, which I hear not infrequently, one of the things that I first wonder about is whether they are clinically depressed or anxious. And if this is someone that I'm coaching, I might ask some more questions because if they're clinically depressed or anxious, then the suggestions that I might make may not work. So for example, I might want to suggest some of the strategies that I talk about in my book Onward. I might want to talk about meditation or self-care, looking for the bright spots. But if someone is depressed, then they don't have the capacity to engage in those strategies and it ends up making them feel worse because they're like, I know I should meditate. I know Mm -hmm. I should go for a walk. I know I should do all this. But (laughs) You know, so both in my book Onward and on my website, I have this resource that I use to help people self assess for depression and anxiety. Cause again, it's real and it may be helpful for people to know burnout. When you talk about feeling burnt out, burnout is depression, according to the experts. And so I don't want to offer strategies that don't actually really address the root problem. But looping back now to your question, you know, this is a situation in which the person thinking this or feeling is suffering and they deserve healing. And so really the question becomes like, what's the path for that healing to happen? Where does it start? Who can help? Who can support on this healing journey? And feeling the deserving, feeling deserving of the healing is a critical step. That's the self-compassion piece. And so often I find people really struggle with feeling like, yeah, I deserve to feel better. I deserve to heal. And so starting with telling yourself, wow, I really am in a hard spot and I deserve to feel better. I deserve to be cared for. That's the place to start. Mm. That's so good, Alina. Before I ask you to leave us with a takeaway truth, I want you to tell listeners where they can go to find these resources to learn about all of your books. I read Onward um, several years ago when it first came out. It was absolutely phenomenal book on resilience. And um, if there's Anyone listening to this who loves truth for teachers, you will absolutely love Elena's Bright Morning pod- podcast. Um, it is tonally, I feel like, very similar to truth for teachers. And usually it's you speaking straight from the heart and you're talking about these kinds of deeper issues that I feel like a lot of a lot of times are just left out of conversations and education. So um, that's my personal recommendation to people is to get your book onward. I know you have others as well you can tell us about. And definitely subscribe to Bright Morning Podcast because it's just a really phenomenal resource for anyone in education who wants to have transformative uh, coaching, relationships, teaching. It really is um, just really great. But tell us about other work that you do as well well, and other resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that and for that feedback. So I do love doing the podcast. I think that is a great way for people to learn more about me and my work. And of course, it's free and available anywhere the podcasts are found. I think Onward is a great book to start with. I have written six other books, and so you can learn more about those. Uh, you know, Google it or look on my website. Um, my website is brightmorningteam.com, and that's also a place to learn more about the kinds of workshops that my team and I develop. Um, we do free webinars. If you sign up for my newsletter, you'll find out about those. And we are on the socials, and you can find the links for those on my website as well. I really hope that people um, follow you, Elena, and and Thank we you. need more. We need more people learning from you. And I th- just think your resources are so valuable. Thank um, you. Let's close out with our, with our takeaway truth, something that you wish every teacher understood about bringing the best version of themselves to school. So I wish every teacher understood that it is possible is possible to bring the best version of yourself to school. I wish every teacher understood that they uh, that you can have this belief of possibility that it is possible to heal. It is possible to experience a tremendous amount of ease 
in life, a tremendous amount of presence and joy and comfort in life. It's possible to be our full selves and to bring these full, complicated, complete best selves to school, to the living room, to the grocery store, that healing and transformation are possible 